welcome to RICO 12. My name is Justin, and I am a child of an all-powerful and all-loving God and a recovering addict, and am blessed to be the host of this meeting and podcast. RICO 12 is an organization with the mission of learning and sharing the similarities of addictions of all kinds and gaining and sharing tools and hope from others who are walking this same path. We come together from all places, faiths, and backgrounds to gain tools and hope from others who are walking on this path. Speakers from our past meetings have represented so many fellowships, addictions, and afflictions, and we look forward to continuing to add to the diversity of speakers and backgrounds. Today's speaker for the 189th meeting is Melissa T., whose topic is entitled, I Am the Problem and the Solution. We'll get to her talk in the Q&A afterwards in just a minute. First, for a little bit of business, Uh, the last couple of weeks, I've had a few of our email subscribers reach out and ask why they hadn't been getting the emails with with the weekly links. Turns out that their email company had marked Rico 12 as spam and sent the emails to their junk folder. So if you've not been receiving the reminder emails that you had received in the past, please check your junk folders and mark Rico 12 as a safe contact so you can get these reminders in the future. Rico 12 family of of recovery resources continues to grow and have more resources for the addict and the loved ones of those addictions. I invite you to go and listen to and subscribe to some of the other Rico 12 podcasts, including Rico 12 Noodle It Out with Nikki M., which the most recent release uh, this last week was called Noodling Out Expectations and Resentments. And it was a really cool deep dive into that uh, topic. Or the Rico 12 Big Book Roundtable podcast, where we just finished up deep diving into the forward to the second edition of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I tell you, I am getting so much out of these pages that I just thought were informational. There is so much meat in there. I invite you to go check those out. I highly recommend it. Um, The links to these podcasts are in the show notes of this and all Rico 12 episodes. And I'm super excited about all of these resources and more to come. And your donations and subscriptions are making this all possible as there are costs to build and maintain all of them. On that note, RICO 12 is a self-supporting service and we appreciate your help in keeping us working our 12th step in this manner. I want to thank a few of our spearheads and donors who joined the spearhead ranks recently. Thank you to Marietta, Lisa, and Paige for your recent donations. Those really help in our mission to share this message with others. If you would like to become a a spearhead and support RICO 12 in our mission, please consider going to rico12.com forward slash support and making either a one-time donation or becoming a monthly spearhead donor. We look forward each meeting to receive from the light reflected from our speakers. That light inspires hope, meaning, worth, and growth in us, the listening audience. Now I'm going to introduce today's speaker. Melissa T. I'm really excited about her topic and 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 her sharing her experience, strength, and hope. But here's a little bit about her. Melissa came into the rooms of Al Anon 15 years ago to learn how to fix all the dysfunctional, maddening people in her life. Fortunately, when that didn't work, she stuck around to fix herself. She is a member of the Big Book Sponsorship Group and sponsors fellows in Coda. Al-Anon, and SLA. She credits her recovery journey for the beautiful life she has today and considers it a privilege to share her experience, strength, and hope with others. Take it away, Melissa. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Justin. I'm so grateful to be here. Hello to everyone on this call and to all my fellows. I appreciate you guys. So my name is Melissa. I am a grateful member of Many, many fellowships. Um, Today, I consider my primary fellowship to be CODA, but I also have a long history with Al-Anon where I started my fellowship journey. And I also attend uh, SLA meetings and ACA meetings once in a while. So before I get started, I wanna share a little bit of recovery, but it's also like a reminder that it's progress, not perfection. And that's the fact that I never ever tell people when I'm going to be speaking, ever. I am like the quintessential hider. Um, And now granted, I've known about this for probably six months, I'd say, Justin, but still an hour, I'd say before uh, this meeting, I started reaching out to people and some people, close friends and other people, just acquaintances who they may not know this, but they're people that have been instrumental in my recovery. They played a, a critical role in my recovery. And I just reached out to say, hey, I'm going to be speaking. So not only for me is that progress with just my fear of visibility, but I was thinking about it and I can even go like a layer under that. And for me, it's about establishing intimacy and 
I never realized this, but the only way you can establish intimacy, and this is probably why I've historically struggled with it so much, is like, you have to be willing to be seen and trust that people are going to support you, even if you're not perfect, even if you show them sort of the unvarnished, like, this is me, like, this is live, like, I may fumble over my words, it may not be my, oh, my God, that was a home run, you know, the way we judge ourselves. And historically, I think I've always feared that there's like this shot and fraud happening where even if people seem like they're my friends, they're just waiting for me to trip up so that they can celebrate that. God forbid they see me. And now it's like, okay, I don't, I don't have to be perfect. I just have to be honest today. And I know that I'm capable of being honest and to trust that like all of you who are here today, like want what's best for me and support me in my journey is super powerful for me. And it's really a new thing for me. So thank you all so much. So that being said, um, like I said, you know, CODA is my primary meeting today, but I started in Al-Anon and I really qualify for any of the meetings that we call um, process addictions, which for anyone who's not familiar with those, because it's a word that I only learned over the last you know year, um, a process addiction is any addiction that is not an addiction to a substance. So it's an addiction to control, to validation, to fantasy, to sort of the people, places, and things versus, you know, alcohol, drugs, uh, food, something like that. And I think that it's probably my need to control that has sort of spared me from the path of being addicted to a substance. But as I'm sure most people here can relate, it's just as painful. Right. And it's taken me a really long time to recognize that, that it is just as painful. So, like I said, I came into these rooms about 15 years ago now, which is like a lifetime ago, um, through traditional Al Anon rooms. And I wound up in those rooms because I was seeing a therapist at the time and I would go to her and I would just like dump all the interpersonal issues I was having with everyone in my life. And she would just very gently say, have you tried out that Al-Anon meeting that I told you about yet, that group? And I was like, I'm not an alcoholic. I don't, you know, I, I don't know if I told her that explicitly. I probably just yesed her to death, but I never went. Like it took me a really, really long time. I finally went because this big thing happened in my family, this big blow up. And I was literally on my knees. I didn't know what else to do. So I went to a meeting and like I said, or Justin, like you said in my intro, I was like, maybe this group is going to tell me how to deal, like how to fix my family and how to finally, you know, help my family recover because they all had all these problems as I perceived it. And I quickly realized that that wasn't going to happen. But I'd say like my second or third meeting, because they always say like, if you don't relate to this meeting, you know, at least go back six times. There's all, all different speakers, whatever. So in one of my early meetings, I heard someone that had the same trauma that I had. And it was, you know, an abuse that I thought, like, I'm never going to talk about. I'm never going to be able to get over. It's going to stay secret for the rest of my life. And this woman, like, was talking about it. And she still had so much joy in her life and so much abundance in her life. And I couldn't believe that she was able to get up in front of this whole room and, like, share these deep, dark secrets. And so I kept coming back. And... I was in Al-Anon for about a decade, maybe a little bit more before I found the rooms of um, the big book sponsorship group. And I believe that God doesn't make mistakes. And I think that everything happens for a reason. But well, I'll just say what I did get from those rooms to start with. So I think at that time, I really just needed a space, a safe space where I could share how I was feeling and feel like I wasn't alone. And just people nodding and having like these three minutes to talk and knowing that other people had experienced the same thing I did was so, so helpful for me. And we all learn at our own pace. Maybe for me, it took 10 years before I could find the big book fellowship rooms where I really feel like I experienced this like much quicker recovery. Like the truth is if I would have just gone from nothing and this, this is my experience, right? I'm not saying this is what would work for everybody, but if I had just found myself from nothing to the big book meetings, it may have been too much for me, right? Like it just may have been way too much for me. So this was my path, but I found relief in those Al-Anon meetings, not recovery. And so I would leave the meetings and I would feel like, yeah, you know, people get it. I'm not alone. 
And then 10 minutes later, I'd be right back into my, like, I'm all alone in the world, right? So about two and a half years ago, I decided to, I, I, uh, anorexic when it comes to sex and love. So I go long periods of time without dating anyone. So at about two and a half years ago or three years ago, I was like, it's time for me to get back out there. And I wound up dating someone for about uh, a month. And then things got real and I freaked out and it ended, I ended it. And so many emotions were coming up for me. And I was a mess. I live in New York and like I was crying on every subway I got on. And I just, I had enough recovery to know, like, I hate using the word normal, but I'm going to use it here. Like, I was like, this isn't normal. I know that there are, there's a fellowship for this and I should probably get my butt in that fellowship. So it was during the pandemic. And so everything was online. And so I wound up in a slaw meeting. And then I think the second slaw meeting that I wound up in was through the Big Book Fellowship. I didn't know. I didn't know what I was going into. And I'll never forget it because if you guys know it very well. It was the Friday night Q&A Big Book meeting. And once a month, they do uh, a gratitude meeting. <laughs> and here I am ready to like vomit all my sadness, my resentment, my frustrations, and all these people are just talking about gratitude. And I hated you all. Like, I was just so angry. I was like, this is not what I need. Like, what the hell is this nonsense? You know? And, but I stayed on the meeting and, you know, they said like, oh, they explained that they were a big book fellowship and what they did. And here's a link if you want to check out any of our other meetings. And even though I was so resentful, I think it's just a testament to higher power that there was this kernel inside of me that was like, I don't, I don't like these people and I'm not, they're not letting me do what I want to do. And still like, there's something there that I'm jealous of, that I'm envious of, and that part of me wants, you know? And so I followed that link and I, you know, attended some other meetings and I've got to say, they were just marginally better as far as I was concerned, <laughs> because even though they weren't focused around gratitude, it was still a bunch of people sharing like I had never heard people share before, you know, and it was just God this and God that and gratitude this and gratitude that. And like, I was in recovery for 10 years. Like I was perfectly comfortable sharing. I loved sharing. And here I was in these rooms, I was shutting my mouth. I was terrified to share because I was like, oh, these people are quoting the big book. They're all happy. Like I stayed quiet for a long time. And, and that's like, think exactly what I needed to do. It was just totally foreign to me. It was a whole new way of doing things. But again, that kernel, like I still wanted something that you guys had, you know? So I kept coming back. That was about two and a half years ago. And I found a sponsor in those meetings. And at first, you know, I got hooked up with someone who just wasn't a fit and that was totally fine. And I was like, you know what? I think it's great that there's somebody who connects us to sponsors, but I want to pick someone for myself. And so I did. And she was great. And she... I remember we started out and I was telling her at the time, like um, I was considering using my savings to pay for recovery for a loved one to, to pay for like a treatment center. And I remember she was like, well, have you thought about doing that for yourself? And I was like, doing that for myself. Like, I'm not, I'm not an alcoholic, like, you're like, whatever. I'm not an addict. Like, no. And she made me realize that even after 10 years in Al-Anon, I was still focusing on the other person, right? And I still hadn't quite got the message that like, yeah, I may not be an alcoholic or a drug addict, but I'm not okay. I'm suffering, you know? I'm not living the life that I deserve to lead. I'm just getting by. I'm just surviving. And I deserve so much more than that, you know? And she helped me see that. So we started working the steps and... I will say one thing right off the bat with the Spiritual Gangsters Big Book Fellowship that was so extremely helpful to me was viewing myself as an addict. It was something that I never viewed myself as before. And so in Al-Anon, I really saw myself as like, you know, I'm the friend or family or sister or brother. Or I attract partners who are addicts and everything. And just that slight shift of viewing myself as an addict, you wouldn't think, but it actually like it helped me feel so much like it helped me connect with a sense of power 
and a sense of hope. Because if you think about it, like the folks who are in the the substance, and this is my take on it, my perspective, I think folks who are in the substance programs, they're very clear on what their goal is. It's like, if you ask them if you had any wish in the world, it's like, I want to get sober, right? But as somebody who was attending Al-Anon, if I was being honest, my wish was that the people around me would get their act together. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? And so somehow shifting that and seeing myself as an addict, all of a sudden it was like, I'm going to learn how to recover regardless of what anyone around me is doing, you know? And so that was huge for me. Like there was, there was real hope there. Um, And I know, I think that some people struggle, people I've spoken to struggle with step one. They don't want to admit powerlessness. They associate it with helplessness. But for me, like powerlessness, there's such a sense of power in that because it's power. It's not like, general abstract powerlessness. It's recognizing what you are powerless over so that you are free to pivot your energy and your time to what you actually have power over, like yourself, your own needs, your own desires, your own goals. Like that's what it's been like for me. Um, And I love the saying, and this is sort of where I got the title for this for, like if someone, and it's what I learned, you know, a little while ago, it's like, if somebody else is the problem, there's no solution. And like, let that sit with you for a second, because anytime I hear someone even start to go down the road of things would be so much better for me, if only fill in the blank, whoever would do whatever, it's like, okay, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Because we will never be able to control another person. The only thing we can do is focus on what we need to do. So I stopped when I started seeing myself as an addict, I stopped seeing myself as like the victim. And I started seeing as some myself as someone who was largely responsible for really manufacturing their own misery. And I made a conscious decision that I wanted to stop doing that. So that changed when I started doing the step work with my sponsor and specifically step four for me was a real game changer. I don't know if you guys can relate, but there was something about doing those columns. And it was the first time I had ever done that where I was really able to see my part in things. And for me, like my part was just like my mind, right? It's like what I believe to be true. And when I came to these rooms, when I did these steps for the first time, I considered myself a really self-aware person. Like this isn't my first rodeo. I've done a lot of work on myself in the past. So I really believed when I was looking at my relationships that people weren't showing up for me, you know, somehow because of all my trauma, I kept attracting friends and partners and you name it, people that just like could not show up for me and just were not great friends, partners, fill in the blank. And when I did my fourth step, I saw how needy I was and I saw how fearful I was, which must have been so draining for everyone in my life. I saw how little faith I had. I saw how absurd my expectations were on people, you know, and these are just things that I didn't see before. It's like we it's like that expression. We see the world not as it is, but as we are, you know. And I just, I just didn't know these things. So yeah, I thought other people were making me miserable and it was all these ridiculous expectations that were making me miserable. So, and I, it's like that saying, like, do I, I realized like, do I want to be also, because I, I don't think this is exactly the same thing, but I also asked myself, like, do I want to be right or do I want to be happy? You know, do I want to look at every single relationship in my life and be like, well, I think so-and-so should have done that, you know? Or do I want to say, you know what, this person like me isn't perfect. This may not be their strong suit, right? I have a tendency to expect that one friend is going to provide every single thing I need. So it's like, okay, maybe this person is not my recovery friend. They can't go super deep with me, but they've shown up for me. They plan birthday parties. They love me. They give me as much as they could give based on the person that they are. And guess what? It's my responsibility to find other people who you know, sir, like not serve is a terrible word. That's not what I mean, but other people who provide other things in my relationship, right? That's why I have recovery. I have all of you guys. If I want to get deep into the, you know, if I really want to talk about like emotional stuff and I want to surround myself with emotionally intelligent people who can go there, 
there's over 2000 people in this fellowship. I have my pick, you know? So that was super, super helpful for me. So, and another big thing, I know I haven't talked about HP, but HP has been a huge part of my life. Like I had to start letting go of fear and choosing faith over fear. And they're two of the same coin, right? Like when we're in fear, we're not in control. We're fearful of what may happen. People think like, I I didn't grow up with God. Like I can't have faith. I don't believe in that. It's just the same thing. It's just pick your thoughts, right? Like pick what you're choosing to focus on. Both are abstract. Like fear is no more concrete than faith is, you know? And today I choose faith because it serves me. Like, that's the thing. I had someone remind me once that like our thoughts, it's kind of like a ticker. Like, you know, like you see across CNN or whatever news channel you watch. It's like you have a million thoughts per day. Like choose wisely, like pick the ones that serve you that are going to help you in your growth and in your life. And so, yeah, so today I feel like this is like my coming out. Like I am a person who has like a strong spiritual foundation. I still don't know if I would say religious, but like I say God all the time. I don't even, it used to be when I first started recovery, everything was higher power. I say God now. The, one of the biggest game changers in my recovery was going to two-way prayer. I'd say I went almost every single day for about a year straight. It was huge for me. I sort of joke and it's a little bit dark, but I don't have like a close relationship with my family. And I've always said that like, if God forbid something happened to me and they ever wound up being the people that had to like come to my apartment and sort through things, they would be like, who is she? Like, we don't even, who, are you sure this is her apartment? Because I just have like notebooks upon notebooks filled with like me in two-way prayer, right? Talking to God, connecting with God, journaling. God often comes up in my journaling. And I grew up with, I grew up Jewish. Well, my parents are both Jewish, but I grew up with none of that. And today I have to say that that's like one of the most important parts of my life, because instead of being that person who's constantly in a state of fear and needs to dial 17 friends to talk her down from a ledge, I don't do that anymore. And I talk about this a lot in the rooms and it's not to say that like, I don't see the value of like fellowship and outreach. I absolutely do, but it like has a different tone for me now. It's just different. It's not this like crisis hotline anymore, which is not to say that I never feel like I'm in crisis. And this is the beautiful thing. It's like when the stuff really hits the fan for me, my first like action is not to call someone. Like my first action is to meditate, is to carve out some time for myself, is to connect with my higher power um, and really see like what's going on. And that's how I talk myself down from the ledge. Then I connect with people. I'm not saying I isolate. I don't do that either. But I know for me, I know I'm very clear on where to go for what. And higher power is usually the first place I go. And I'll also say that for me, like, connect cultivating relationship with my higher power is also like cultivating a relationship with myself and not self in the way we sort of like criticize it in these rooms where it's like you're selfish you're self-serving like all of that but self in this really authentic sense of just like the self that acts as the antidote to codependency right the self that's like i know who i am i can validate myself I can fulfill my own needs. The people and everybody else is like the cherry on the Sunday, right? But they're not the Sunday, like that kind of self. And the more I'm sort of connected with God, the more I'm able to connect with myself. So that's been a really beautiful gift for me. Um, The other part of the step work that was huge for me was step nine. I remember, you know, like probably most people, I was dreading it a little bit. But I haven't done all of my amends. I think I've done four of them at this point. But they were just these people that like, I had this like energy that was still like between us, even though we weren't speaking. And I just, I don't know, like I just always had this feeling, you know, I'm still like a people pleaser at my core, right? Like that's part of my disease. And so I hated the idea that there were people out there that had like, a bad taste in their mouth from like our relationship. And for a really long time, I just thought like, 
if only I was still friendly. Thank you so much, Justin. Oh my God, I can talk. I felt like if only I was still friends with them, like, you know, things would be better. And I think it was something that really kind of made me feel a lot of shame. And when I was able to connect with them and do these amends, like, And again, I was able to do amends the way I had heard that you need to do them, right? These are people who I thought had wronged me as well, but I let go of all that. None of that came into this amends process. And surprise, surprise, and I'm not saying this is going to be this way for every single one or for everyone who does this, but when I did, when I said my piece, every single one of these people then acknowledged their stuff, right? Like this thing that I'd wanted them to do, like the whole time in our relationship, like when I just let go of it and said, I'm going to be good no matter what, I'm just here to own my part, my side of the street, they wound up owning theirs. And the other amazing thing was that like, once we had this whole conversation, even though they all ended so beautifully, I no longer felt like I needed to be connected to them anymore. I actually felt like, you know what, they were played an important role in my life. And now we're no longer energetically, you know, a match and that's really okay. And sometimes we still check in to just say like, happy birthday, or sorry to hear about this, but that's all it is. And it's beautiful. And I'm okay with that, you know? So I think the last things I want to say are that um, some real big game changers for me also are like, I heard it in spiritual gangsters for the first time. Like I do the things I don't want to do. And that's huge for me. Like I don't procrastinate on all the like things that I'm just like not wanting to do because the irony is like a lot of those things take very little time, but what they do take a lot of is space in your head and they prevent you from using that space for other things. So now I just do them, right? I do them. Sometimes I talk on the phone while I clean my apartment or while I do other things. But when it's not like every day going to like the next day's to-do list, it frees you up to like have this bigger, more abundant life. Um, I also don't go to the hardware store for oranges as much. And I don't stay there when I do go there. You know, I used to go there. And then when it was like, we don't have oranges, it was like, what do you mean you don't have oranges? Don't you know how much I need oranges? You know, like that was kind of my way with my family. And it's like, Now I walk out and I'm like, that's right. So where's the nearest supermarket? Like who can give me oranges instead of like screaming at the person, you know, in wherever store because they can't, and metaphorically, because they can't give me oranges, you know? So it's not like I never go there, but I interrupt myself a lot quicker. Um, I had someone tell me with regards to like my family, like it's when we do that, when we, when we go to the wrong person who we desperately want to be able to give us something that they can't give us she was like, it's like you're expecting your mom or whoever to like do calculus with you when you know full well, she's never gone past third grade math, you know? And I don't say that in like a critical way in like a nasty way. It's just, that's on me, right? Like that's so unfair to ask that of someone when you know they literally can't do it even if they wanted to, right? And it seems so like, oh yeah, obviously when you, for me, when I say it in those terms, but when it comes to emotional stuff, it's like, no, but you should be able to. And it's like, no, they shouldn't. They don't know. They haven't done what you're doing, you know? And now I can just be grateful that I'm doing it. Um, And I think the last thing I'll say, because I know I'm probably like a little bit over, is that I heard something the other day that really resonated. And this person said, the future determines the present. And the present determines the past. And what they meant by that was that, oh my God, and now I'm forgetting. The present determines the past. It's all about the way we reframe things. So it's like this idea of your dark past is your greatest asset. So my present time, I'm deciding like the person who I want to be. I'm choosing to use my dark past as my greatest asset to help people, right? So the fact that I'm choosing to do that I get to look back at my past as not like, hey, this is the worst thing that ever happened to me and it screwed up my life forever. But hey, this is a gift that is now allowing me to help people and to make different decisions in my life that like, I wouldn't be on this path at all. I wouldn't be speaking on a podcast today. You know what I mean? If it wasn't for this stuff. So, and the same thing goes for our future. It's like, who do you wanna be? Where are you going in terms of in your future? that's going to help you reframe what your past is and what decisions you make today, right? So even the difficult things are are taking you to the next step on your path 
of where you want to be and where, you know, God wants you to be and what's best for us. So with that, um, thank you for letting me share. And I'm excited to hear from you guys. Thank you. Wow, Melissa. Uh, my mind is blown in several ways. Thank you so much for this share. Uh, so appropriate, so timely for me. And I'm sure for others out there who are walking this path, a couple of things that you said that I just want to reiterate before we get into the Q&A when we've got several uh, questions that have come in from the live audience. I've written down some. So if you in the live audience have questions, type it in the Q&A link at the bottom of your Zoom window. Looks like two speech bubbles over the top of each other. But your, your, your statements here, I don't go to the hardware store for oranges. That just, that, that rings so true to me today. Thank you so much for that. All right. We're going to jump into the questions here though. All right. First question comes from an anonymous attendee. Melissa, I feel both powerless and helpless. I want everyone else to change. I have no idea how to go inward. What are some simple ways to start shifting this? Yeah. Beautiful question. So for me, um, like I said, two-way prayer was a real game changer for me because it really is so it's really at the root of this program because this, this, these programs are about getting out of our own way and recognizing that like our best thinking got us here and all our ruminations got us to this place where we have to just let go. We have to surrender. Right. And so the only way that I can let go, I don't know about you, is if I know that there's some kind of safety net underneath me that's there to catch me when I let go, right? And so for me, that is the higher power part, part of this fellowship. And so going to two-way prayer, asking those questions during that 10 minutes when we're writing, telling higher power how I feel, asking like, what is the next right action for me? You know, and sometimes it was just breathe or whatever the case may be. You know, I think it's really important to say, like I hear people talk sometimes and I'm like, I want what they have. How do I get there? It's like, you don't get there tomorrow. You don't get from point A to point Z. If you're feeling powerless and helpless, don't beat yourself up if you're not going from A to Z. Go from A to B. Have one day where you're just gentle with yourself and you do a little bit of outreach and you go to two-way prayer. Little by little, those things build traction and build momentum. Thank you so much, Melissa. And for those of you out there going, what the heck is two-way prayer? I put the link in the chat here. I'll put it in the show notes. Two-way prayer is, well, I, I define it as my daily bread, as my manna in the wilderness that keeps me keeps me going one day at a time. So thank you so much for sharing about that. And beautiful, beautiful. All right, Melissa, next question comes from Erica from our live audience. Erica says, How do you cultivate a relationship in the beginning? How do you know God was working in your life? And how did you maintain a relationship with higher power when situations feel against you? Yeah, you believe in spite of whatever is happening in your life. You have faith that even if you can't see where ultimately this challenging thing is going to take you, you have faith that you're going to wind up where you need to be. Um, And... Yeah, I do. I think two-way prayer was a huge part of that for me. Will you repeat the question one more time? Because something came up when you first said it, and now I've forgotten it. Absolutely. The first part, how do you cultivate a relationship in the beginning? How do you know God was working in your life? And how did you maintain that relationship with higher power when situations feel against you? And if you want to read that, there's a little Q&A link at the bottom. You can pull up this screen and you can read those questions too. Awesome. Awesome. So I'll just share with you. I don't know if this is a roadblock that you're having, but for me, I would say during the time really when I was in Al-Anon, this was happening. I was using God like uh, Santa Claus. (laughs) Like I was just like, you know, I would trot out God at the times when I was really desperate. And, you know, it was like, I need you now, God, like it was a crisis hotline. And that's not how my higher power, my God works for me today, right? Now it's about even when things are really tough, like getting on my knees and saying, I know you've got me. I've had some really scary health crises, right? And it's still like, I know that it's going to be okay. I know that you got me, you know? And I also ask myself, like, am I living the way that God wants me to live, right? So like before absolutes and am I being unselfish? Am I being this? And for me, like doing believing even when it's hard, you know, it's like, it's kind of like what I said with the, 
CNN ticker, like choosing what we want to believe. So you can choose during hard times that God has dropped you and God is nowhere in sight, or you can choose that ultimately you're going to learn a really powerful, important lesson in your life and that you trust that, right? <clears throat> yeah. Thank you so much, Melissa. And and everybody out there, um, Melissa's teaching a probably a sixth grade class. And if you're in kindergarten like me, some of the things she's saying are very important, but you will learn them as you practice two-way prayer and get into that. The four absolutes, for example, um, these are things that uh, are super powerful, absolute love, unselfishness, purity, and uh, honesty. And that's what the four absolutes are. And just look into those things and, and figure these things out. It's amazing. All right. Next question comes from another anonymous attendee. They ask, how did you begin to build a relationship with yourself and identify who you really are and also build that relationship with higher power? Yeah. So a lot of what I'm saying, I really believe this. Like for me, I didn't see a lot of progress in me building a relationship with myself until I started doing this work. And I wasn't conscious of the fact that I was building a relationship with myself. I was really trying to cultivate a relationship with higher power because that's always been my biggest struggle. But I really think that the two are just so intrinsically related and connected. Um, because as I started doing that, I started building relationship with myself because when I would carve out that quiet time and I would ask God, like, what do you, what do you want from me? Or what is my next step? It was such a loving God that I was creating for myself that I just feel like I was always hearing compassion. I was always hearing gentleness. I was always like, God was my cheerleader. Right. And little by little, my fear was starting to kind of like recede into the background and it was freeing up room for other things in my life. And it's honestly like, it's really, there's something really kind of magical and mystical about it because I wasn't conscious of what was happening. I can look back now and talk about it. But at the time I was just really trying to cultivate this relationship with higher power. And little by little, it was chipping away at fear it was freeing up more time for me and it was helping me get in touch with who I was authentically at my core. And it took time and it's ongoing, by the way. It's not like, Oh, I'm there. You guys, I'm, you know, whatever. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you so much for that. I, uh, good stuff. And I've got this next question. Actually, I want to, I want to go to, to another question here real quick. You know, you mentioned in your talk how, when, um, when the stuff hits the fan, I think is what you said. Uh, <laughs> your first reaction is no longer to pick up the phone and call 17 other people, but to, you know, uh, figuratively or literally hit your knees and connect with higher power, whatever that may be. And that takes me to, you know, the process of step 10 is listed in the big book where we first, we watch for, you know, selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. And when these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. And then we discuss it with someone else immediately. Talk to me a little bit about that. If somebody I'm working with, or if I am having this issue that when something happens, I pick up the phone and start making calls before I go to higher power. Tell me, tell me a little bit about why the benefit, maybe the benefits of going to higher power first are and, and how that works in your life. Yeah, it's, it's such a great question. So for me, I ask myself when I have that instinct and that feeling of like, oh, shoot, I'm in fear, or I don't know what action to take or whatever. A lot of times it's not about like what action to take. If I'm really stumped, I'm like, oh, I have two actions in front of me, potential roads to take, and I want to get another person's perspective. Like that's different. I'll reach out. And actually this takes me back to what I'm going to say. So when I get that powerful feeling of just like, uh-oh, right? First thing I do is go, what do I need here? And I really drop into my body and I ask myself, and this is where it's a little bit like, um, like some ACA, like inner child stuff. Um, but I asked myself, like, what is it you need here? Cause I never used to ask myself that it was like, I would have a feeling, uh oh, like feelings are scary time to like reach out to someone. Like it's a hot potato so I can like dump it on them, you know? And I wasn't even really conscious of what, no wonder, like, I felt like people were letting me down left and right. I wasn't even really conscious of like what they could do or what I wanted from them. You know, that's why I also think it's tangentially related. Like, it's so important. Like if somebody calls me up and they're in that state where it's like, I have a feeling, blah, blah, blah. 
I asked them like, how, what would be helpful for you today? Do you just want me to listen to you? Are you looking for feedback? Blah, blah, blah. Because it helps also push people in that direction, right? Like what, what do you need right now? I think that's what we really need to get in touch with. Like, what do I need right now? Because you'll have a lot of clarity about then what is the next right step? And oftentimes you realize you don't really need to phone a friend, right? You don't, you know, my friends used to give me a bunch of like either well-meaning platitudes, which I didn't need, or, you know, or they would be the kind of friends who weren't in recovery who would just sort of like fan the flames of whatever you're feeling. Like, you're right, that person's a big jerk. It's true. Like, that's not helpful, you know? So I ask myself, what do I need? And oftentimes I just need that grace and I need to relax and I need to know that like I'm safe, I'm cared for. And a lot of that comes from my relationship with higher power. Mm, beautiful. Thank you for walking through that like that, Melissa. Very helpful. Okay, next question comes from Zach from our live audience. Hi, Melissa. Thank you so much for your share. Can you speak to step two, specifically learning to let go of fixed ideas of higher power and how things are? What is your experience on becoming open-minded to a new way of living? Yeah, I won't say for me, the connection with higher power was easy, but I think the willingness was easy. It took me a while to get there, but because I came to fellowship on my knees and like, there's a part of me, I was thinking about this and I was thinking about my family the other day, because my whole family is like, they're in a really bad way. Right. And I have a lot of like, I deal with like survivor's guilt about that, but there's just like this part of me that has always been like, I, no matter what happens, like I am going, I will find a way to like cling on for dear life. I will find a way to like pull myself back up. You know what I mean? It's not to say I haven't been through some really hard times. And again, it's a part of me. There's other parts of me that stay in bed for three days, right? There's other parts of me that eat a pint of ice cream, right? But I will say that about me. Like there's always this part of me that's just like, I will do what it takes. I will try everything because I want to live and I want to thrive, you know? And so the reason I say that is because I had no relationship with God. I actually believed that God was a crutch. I judged people who were religious, but at a certain point, my life was so unmanageable that I was like, just finding people who seem to have joy in their lives and people in these rooms. And if they told me that God is what helped them get there, sign me up. So I didn't have this like huge sense of resistance to like this idea of God. I didn't really know how to like form that connection until I slowly got there. But if you're like me and you just, you're like, I just, I want something better. There's not such a huge block for me. Thank you, Melissa. Do you see that? How do you see that differently for somebody who maybe grew up very religious and very stringent with their understanding of what they knew God to be like? Um, How do you find approaching a person like that different than maybe someone like yourself who grew up, uh, God is a crutch? Yeah, that's a really good point, right? Because I don't want to minimize some people have experienced real like trauma regarding religion, right? But I would just say it's going to be a process, but this is not the God of your childhood, right? This is different. And I know some people, I feel like it's people who haven't really tried these rooms that have the impression that we're forcing God down your throat, but we're really not. It's a God of your understanding. For the longest time, my higher power was a tree that was in my backyard, a tree. Okay. Like, it it can be whatever you want. It can be the people in these rooms, right? It can be this, the rooms themselves. You know, I joke around now that my God, even though I consider myself like super progressive New Yorker, my God is like an old man with a beard because my God looks like Dumbledore from Harry Potter or whatever. I get confused with him in Lord of the Rings, but I think it's Harry Potter because like, I just, I take some comfort in that idea of like this benevolence, older guy that I see in the movies or whatever. The point is you get to choose your higher power, you know, and it might take some people more time than others, but just remember, like, this is your choice. This is not about what whatever was force fed down your throat as a kid. 
Thank you, Melissa. I appreciate that. Um, Everly from my live audience says, oh, my genius hardware store for oranges. So funny and relatable. Um, now, she she then goes on and says, in the beginning, you talked about process addictions versus substance addictions. Tell us a little bit about, explain what the difference is for those who may not understand what that is. And tell us a little bit about why process addictions may be frowned, not frowned upon, but maybe looked down upon by others and why you think that they are very similar and maybe the same. Yeah. So I'll start with, I guess, what I, the, the difference. So the process addictions are addictions that you don't associate with a particular substance, right? So not things like alcohol and, and by the way, Justin, you know, I don't know this so well, you probably know it even better, but I believe it's like not drugs, not alcohol, not food, but more so these kind of abstract concepts. Like when I came into Al-Anon, the way that it was structured was like, okay, we're here, this program is for people who are their friends, family, and loved ones of addicts, right? Which sounds like, oh, okay, we're the normal ones and we're just here because the other people have a problem. But we learn that this is a family disease. So if I'm living with an addict, I become someone who has all these other kinds of pathologies, like I want to control everything and I'm a people pleaser and I have no boundaries and I'm not direct, I'm passive aggressive and I'm judgmental as all hell and all these other things, which make our lives unmanageable, right? We're no healthier than the people who are picking up whatever substance it is that they're picking up. Now, in terms of your question about like people judging us, I don't know exactly what you mean as far as that goes. And I'm not so concerned with how other people view my addiction. I just know that it's in incredibly painful. And growing up in a family with addiction and dysfunction, that I developed these behaviors as coping mechanisms, which got me through my childhood, but no longer serve me as an adult. And I want to get rid of them. Yeah. And thank you for, uh, discussing that. And the, um, and maybe that part of the question where I put in there, Hey, people looking down on process addictions who may be alcoholic or drug addicts or whatever, uh, it may have been overstated because, you know, one of the things that I, one of the things that Rico 12 is all about is seeing that addiction is addiction is addiction. And the solution is the solution is the solution. And, uh, and that's one thing that I've learned over the years as I've been doing this is that, you know, I may be a sex addict, I may be a food addict, I may be a drug addict, an alcoholic, whatever it may be, I may be whatever that is. But in the end, it's like what you said, it's what worked for me, either in childhood, early adulthood, whatever, to help fill a hole where I was just trying to survive. And it worked for me for a little while, but it no longer serves me well. And, and I love how you explain that. Thank you, Melissa. Um, next question I have for you, and I loved, you You brought this up um, about when you were going, maybe first or as you went into the rooms of Al-Anon initially, you said, you know, I was, I felt relief, but not recovery. And, you know, I hear other people, I, I was abstinent, but not in recovery. Tell me a little bit about the difference between relief or abstinence and recovery. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, for me, like I was saying, like, I think I just needed to be heard and needed to feel like I wasn't alone and like I could share things that I didn't have anyone to share with previously. And th those rooms were really helpful. Um, but the rooms that I was attending, like not a lot of people were doing the step work. Um, you know, you would hear like Nikki always, you know, <laughs> disparagingly like meeting makers make it or whatever. And like, yeah, people would come up with these slogans that quite frankly, like aren't necessarily true, right? Like it's important to attend meetings, but I think the reason why, and this might sound a little like heady, but like the reason why 12 step, I have like the utmost respect for 12 step. And I think the reason why it's like one of those most successful behavior modification programs is because it is experiential. You have to do the work. That's how you have like a psychic change, right? I have, I'm sure you guys all know, like I have friends, I have friends who are therapists. They read every self-help book on the shelf. I was that person too. They can give the best advice. They're still not taking different actions in their lives. 
like we, the people that I see in these rooms, we're taking different actions in our lives. Like we're changing our lives. Like that's because we do the work. So to get back to the question, it's like, we can find relief in all sorts of different ways, right? Picking up a drink is relief when you're in pain. That doesn't mean it's healthy, sustainable relief, you know? And I don't want to compare that to like being in traditional rooms, but I'm just trying to say that like, there was one level of relief by feeling like I wasn't alone and having people to talk to. And that was great. But actual sustainable change came from working the steps. I don't know if you guys can relate, but like, it was very hard to find a sponsor in Al-Anon. People get this sense of like, I've been a caretaker my whole life. I've been putting other people first. Now it's about me. You know what I mean? Like there's just some kind of twisted thinking a little bit, which I understand on some level, but I don't know if they see the flaws in that thinking. And now I do. So it's just like, we need sponsors. We need to do this work. We need to go on to become sponsors. We need to share the message. That's recovery. That's lasting, sustainable recovery. Thank you for sharing that, Melissa. You know, I want to go back a little bit to the process addictions and and ask a question kind of on that. You know, you mentioned that when you came into the um, rooms, the big book sponsorship rooms, and you started identifying as an addict and accepting, hey, I'm an addict. It may not look like, you know, drugs or alcohol or whatever it may be, but I identify as an addict and I'm going to treat it that way and work the steps as if because I'm an addict. How did that identification um, bring relief one. And what do you say to people who say, you know what, if I say I'm an addict, I'm like, um, basically damning myself. I'm, I'm putting myself in a box, labeling myself as something that is not helpful. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So number one, I don't know. I don't know why it brought me such a sense of like relief right away and power. I can only imagine that it's because like I said, like, I think personal for me i'll give you this example so i've dealt with some chronic health stuff in my life right and i didn't want to just like take antibiotics and just like ha- feel like oh my god my life is in the hands of like 80,000 doctors and pharmaceuticals and whatever so i naturally gravitated towards like more learning more about like the body holistically and like here were all these things that i could do to help myself and one of those things was like hey you need to address your traumas, right? Like I'm a firm believer in the fact that the body and the mind is super, super connected. I had other friends who were going through chronic illness and chronic health stuff who hated the the idea of, hey, there's maybe stuff that we can work on that's going to help because they internalize that as, oh, so this is my fault, right? Like you're blaming me, you're telling me it's psychosomatic, blah, blah, blah. So I may just be the kind of person that like, I find great comfort in thinking that there is something that I can do to help myself. And it goes back to the higher power thing, right? Which is like, okay, if that worked for you, I'm going to try it. Maybe it'll work for me. Maybe it won't. But like, I'm so willing, you know, I'll try what I need to try. And if that doesn't work, then I'll try the next thing. And I I think that ties right into, you know, something you said about, you know, if someone else is the problem, then there is no solution. If the problem is here, if the problem is with me, I can change to hopefully remedy that, that, or I can um, alleviate it with certain treatments or whatever it may be. Um, Talk to us a little bit more about that, that shift of perception, because it's so easy to Well, it's so easy to say that person is the problem. If they would just get their act together, everything would be more smooth. Um, Tell me a little bit about that shift change in your own life and in your own eyes. Yeah, I think for me, I actually saw it in so many instances. And maybe that's what made it a little bit easier. Like starting out in Al-Anon, I would meet a lot of people whose partners were alcoholics. And what I saw happening time and time again was like, you know, they'd come into Al-Anon. It was like, they would give anything for their partner to get into recovery and clean up their act and all this stuff. Right. And then their partner would get sober and their relationship would end because they were no longer a match. Right. Like they were totally unaware of the fact that it takes two, like water seeks its own levels and expression. Right. So like, 
and I hope this isn't like triggering for anyone. Like I, I relate to this. It's just like, I may have dated a lot of alcoholics growing up, but it was because I was also a control freak. I was also a codependent. I, it served me in some way to attach myself to people who I thought I could fix or wanted to fix because then I didn't have to look at my own stuff. So I'll keep it about me. That was me. Right. So it it didn't help. Right. So it was one of those things where I didn't have to like fake it till I made it and just say like, okay, I, I can't control other people. It was like, I kept seeing how that wasn't the answer. Like it just, it just didn't help you know, or like I saw my mom who, you know, to this day, she's like in her seventies and she's like, the problem is my my kids and my husband, like, okay, you can cling to that, but how has it helped you? She's miserable. Do you know what I mean? It's never helped her in the slightest. So I have these like visible examples in front of me that I can look to and say, if that's the road, for that, if that's where that belief leads, I'm not choosing that, <laughs> you know? Uh, thank thank you so much. Melissa, before we get, to, uh, before we close out here, do you have any final words of wisdom for us? No, I have no words of wisdom. <laughs> I really don't. I mean, I just shared my experience, strength and hope. And so much of that I've gotten from you guys. Um, I don't actually know who's on the meeting because I haven't been looked, but Uh, There's just been so many people who have played a critical role for me since I came into the big book fellowship rooms, right? Because I thought I knew it all. I had all these years of recovery and I was a mess. I was a hot mess when I came into these rooms and people picked up my phone calls and they reached out on WhatsApp and they sponsored me and they did service with me and like, and I owe my recovery to all you guys. So thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. And if anybody wants to uh, contact you or are you okay if they reach out to me, email me and I connect them with you through email or something like that? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Definitely. Perfect. All right. So if you would like to uh, speak with Melissa, please send an email to rico12pod at gmail.com. That's R-E-C-O 12-P-O-D at gmail.com. And we'll get uh, get you connected there. Now I'm going to do the close out here. Thank you so much, Melissa. What a great meeting. I loved your topic. I love the way you spoke and presented it. And if you out in the, out there in the audience have other questions, please consider joining our WhatsApp community by sending an email to that same email, rico12pod at gmail.com, and join in our community there. Ask those questions, answer other questions that may come up. And if you're inspired by this and want to share something of your insights in a 12-step type share, please consider going to rico 12 Speak Pipe link that'll be in the uh, show notes of the podcast. Record a three or four minute recovery share there based on what you learned here. Share your experience, strength, and hope with others. And if you've not yet rated and reviewed the podcast and Apple podcast, please consider going to do so now. It's a great way to work your 12th step and help us work our 12th step in getting the message out to more people. Next week, I look forward to hearing from Timber M, whose topic will be my spiritual journey of self-discovery. And it should be a good one. Don't miss it or any of the other Rico 12 resources that will be released over the next week. Now let's launch off into the rest of our day with the serenity prayer that Melissa is going to say for us. I'm going to do the we version. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Thy will, not mine, be done. Thank you, Thank you so much. Oh, go ahead. No, just thank you. Oh, thank you. Remember, everybody, uh, keep coming back. Let's trudge this road of happy destiny together. Work it. You are worth it.
survive the storms and walk through wind and rain. Still standing, I will fight the good fight. Still searching. 